Wilkinson here. My guest today is here for the second time. Mark Hollenstein is my friend and my energy guy, and he's a whole bunch of stuff. So we're going to discuss some of the things we've talked about. I've worked with Mark about five years now, and it's been pretty radical for me. We both have similar backgrounds in the church, Christianity, and I'm always amazed at myself at looking at how I've changed <laughs> over the five years. So I want to start with that. So Mark, first of all, say hi. Hey, everybody. Wilkinson, thanks for having me back for round two. Oh, it's going to be great. It'll be fun. Okay, so we both have Christian backgrounds. We're both into energy stuff. I always say, since I moved to Southern California, everything is so woo-woo around here, which it is. And this, I would put that in the woo-woo category. <laughs> but uh, how did you get from being a pastor in a church to doing energy work with people today? Just give me a kind of overview of that. Where do I start with that? That's um, a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. So I'll just recap slightly on on our first um, interview. As a child, I came in seeing colors around people. We call that the aura. I didn't know everybody didn't see colors. So I came in woo-woo as I'll get out. <laughs> you just didn't know you were woo-woo. I didn't know I was woo-woo. I didn't even know there was a word for it. Now I claim my woo-woo. Okay, I'm going to make t-shirts, woo-woo AF. And what I knew in my youth is that those colors were transmitting information. I was just perceiving information outside of my five senses. When I had my born-again experience, and what I mean by that is when I had somebody lay their hands on me in 1977 and baptize me in the name of the Holy Spirit, that was a very profound experience for me. It was like the top of my head was cut open and it had a hinge on the back and it lifted like a lid. And I, f I literally felt this energy pouring through the top of my head, running through my entire body. When it got to my feet, it began to pool and I just collected it in my entire beingness and the experience of it the only way i could put it into words it was absolute pure unconditional liquid love in the paradigm i was in in the christian denomination they called that the baptism of the holy spirit well i was baptized something happened <laughs> right and what is spirit it's in it's non-physical it's a non-physical being which is another way of saying non-physical energy other paradigms would have called that a kundalini awakening, the, uh, an awakening or a reconnection to the energy of a part of us. I call it our soul. Um, so it wasn't a hard transition for me because I had these experiences. In the church, that baptism, that movement of this liquid love, that Holy Spirit, that non-physical energy that was channeling through me, moving through me, mm -hmm. allowed me to perceive information about people I was working with. In that paradigm, we called it words of knowledge. Where was that coming from? It was coming from inside of me through this energy that I had connected with. In the church, we called that the Holy Spirit, right? Right. In energy work, we simply call that energy. I call it source now. Source and the Holy Spirit in my experience, one and the same. In the church, for a decade as a fundamental Christian pastor, I was moving in what we called then my spiritual gifts. Prophecy, understanding things about people's lives and circumstances and being able to tell them. Words of knowledge, knowing things that were outside of my experience but perceiving the information being able to share it healing by the laying on of hands where energy would move through me what energy in that paradigm the holy spirit people would have an experience some people experienced emotional healing some people experienced physical healing some people experienced mental psychological healing so i've always been moving in energy, it's just a matter of what I, how I identified it. And when I left the church, in my first interview with you, I, t I spoke about my nervous breakdown, which became my breakthrough 
after I left, after I had that breakdown in 1991, I left my ministry. I, two years later, I ended up um, getting divorced and I had to start a new career. So I went to massage school so I could generate cash on a daily basis. And it just became a natural way for me to put my hands on people in some form of healing and on the table outside of the physical massage people were receiving, I was flowing in my gifts. I was, now I call it, I was reading energy intuitively and sharing that information rather than calling it a word of knowledge or a prophecy. I would just say, hey, are you, are you open to hearing what I'm perceiving? And people would say yes, and they would go, oh my gosh, how did you know that? This is what's <laughs> going on. Can you help me do anything with that? It was kind of a very natural progression. Does that answer your question? Partly. So, you know, I've been, I started with you with just massage because I thought you were a massage guy. And then I had an experience where I was introduced to energy work by a friend in Seattle that the lady she hooked me up with didn't, it didn't work out, but it piqued my interest. So then I, of course, we were chatting one day and I said, oh, I think I'm interested in this. And you said, well, did you look at my website? Because that's mainly what I do. And I said, well, I guess I haven't. <laughs> and <laughs> off we went. Just so people understand my process with you. So I'm on a massage table. First we chat for a while. Then I'm on a massage table. And, you know, you're doing, you're moving energy around. I don't even understand all of it. But you're moving energy around on me. You'll see something. Well, I, I see this or that. Or things come to you. And occasionally my well now i've come to understand i have guides as well which of course back in my christian day would have been all cross the fingers into a cross and that's all devil stuff mm. run 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 and as an aside how many th times do you think you said to me in five years just for today let this be true i let i lost count dude i lost count <laughs> yeah okay so that's where i was coming from my knowing has kind of expanded in my realization of different things because the way I look back at it is my Christianity while it served a purpose I inherited a lot of that from my parents particularly my mother and you know you always teach your kids what you know and that's the way it is and everybody else is wrong and we're on the right track blah 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 well I think I've outgrown a lot of that and expanded what was your process in going through something like that because I mean obviously even though you're aware of the energy stuff and then you made the connection, well, this is the same thing with a different name. How did that work for you when you, I mean, do you have you, have you had bumps where it kind of went against your former religious beliefs or Christian beliefs or how, how did all that unfold? Well, yes. When I went to Bible college, it really went against <laughs> my, right? Because I was having, I saw, I saw colors and I, if I, shared that with anybody, I got shut down. So I had stuffed all that away. Prior to going to Baba College, when I had this baptism experience and this release, and the people I was with when I had it got to witness it, now I fit really nicely in their paradigm. I was the epitome of the upper room in second chapter of Acts with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The church wanted people to have the kind of response I was having, right? Okay. So now what was already flowing through me, my ability to perceive, I was just able to call it the Holy Spirit and share the gifts in a paradigm and with a name that people were willing to accept, right? So that made it easy for me and it allowed the gifts to flow. But at, so at that time, though, you thought it was the Holy Spirit, right? Well, I, I, yes, because like you, that's what I was told it was. Right. And, and it, it felt comforting to have a name where people were accepting us. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, so the did I ever bump up against it? So where I began to bump up against anything was as a gay man in the church my entire life, any human that is gay or anywhere... Um, outside of uh, heterosexual normity, right? right? We know we did not choose this. We know that we know that we know that we know. We're willing to believe we did when they keep telling us we did and we're wrong and sick and sinful and less than. And right. we're willing to jump the freaking hoops that they tell us are necessary to get past that. And when none of that worked, I, I knew... I'm like, yeah, they're off. What it took for me to break away from where I kept running up, bumping up against anything was my nervous breakdown. 
And when I had my nervous breakdown that I came to find out was I had my nervous breakdown for two reasons. One, me not being in alignment with who I really am as a gay man married to a woman who put a ring on her finger thinking she was getting a heterosexual husband and me slowly killing her because I couldn't deliver what I promised. Right. Right. That was taking its toll on me and her and our children. <laughs> And I was sexually abused, and that was all in my uh, subconscious mind. I was abused from 6 to 11 years old, and my breakdown brought all that forward, and I got to heal from that. And at that point, that was my defining moment. I knew that me listening to the church and not being who I really am as a gay man was literally killing me. It found its way out. That which we resist persists. So most people, if we're rejecting a part of ourselves, we have to numb the pain. So that's why there's so much addiction with abuse victims or or within the the, um, gay community, right? We have to numb the pain that it that is so debilitating that we can't be ourselves, especially when we're jumping the hoops. They're telling us to jump in religion to stop being what they're telling us we are choosing and we can't be if we want to be in relationship with right. God, right? So at that point, after my my nervous breakdown, I, I had an internal come to Jesus moment. Sitting, lying in my bed after I literally was crying on the floor, sobbing my sorrow out for five solid hours. I was in bed after that for six weeks. At the end of the six weeks, that's when it was, I woke up one day and had just a little bit of strength. Something was slightly different. I took advantage of that. I called a therapist. And that night, I was li- I was listening to the therapist, and I think I said this on my first interview. He said to me, Mark, you're gay, and God made you that way, and it's okay. And I, that, I wasn't expecting him to say that, and that was too much for me in that moment, although it's what I was longing to hear my entire life from a Christian, he was a right. Christian psychologist, right. and a professional, right? When I went home that night, I said to myself, I'm going to see what this guy has to offer. I am never again. I can remember this as sure as I'm sitting here looking at you. I made a declaration. I made a commitment to myself that I will never listen to any external input from anyone who's telling me how to live my life that is contrary to what I know is true for me. Hmm. I made a definitive decision. And from that, I went in so deep. I don't remember how I languaged it then, but I was meditating or praying. Now I have a very solid meditative pract- meditation practice, but then I just sat still and I listened <laughs> and I went in so mm. deep to connect with whatever that was that flowed through me in 1977, that, that Kundalini awakening or that holy baptism in the Holy Spirit. I knew that was the energy of my soul. And right. I made a decision. I'm going to connect with that so deeply and only follow that guidance only follow that guidance regardless and that's how i've lived the rest of my life and from that more energy flows through me more ability to perceive outside of my five senses and external stimulus makes itself known and Mm -hmm. i just share that which is what you experience on my table and from that people are like how do you do that and so i started to notice that I was telling people how I did that and there was kind of a systematic way that I did. And so from that, I put these deep dive and weekends together, which I learned a lot of skills in a men's group early in my coming out. A wonderful man named Michael Sigmund started this group called uh, The Men's Inner Journey and I became one of his facilitators and I learned a lot of skills in group facilitation, but it was a natural place for for me to let this energy flow and let my perception support other people. And then after I built a foundation there, I just brought it into my own expression of that. Um, And so I've put together these four-day intensives where I take people 
through the system. What I found out for myself, when I was lying on the floor, bawling my eyes out for five solid hours, somewhere on the other side of that, I understood, oh my God, I have been carrying a well of sorrow for a long time. Right. And working with the men's group and then developing my own um, programs, I'll just call it programs, I've realized, every, all the, I've literally worked with thousands of people now over 30 years. Every single person who wants to go deep, what I've discovered is we all carry a well of sorrow and a volcano of anger. On my four days, I help people drain their well of sorrow and their volcano of anger so substantially that there's this space now to connect with that very thing I connected with, which is the energy right. of our source. Our well of sorrow and our volcano of anger are both stuck emotion. Emotion is stuck energy, non-physical information in our bodies. So you clear your well of sorrow and your volcano of anger, and you see radical transformation in a very short period of time. I remember when I was going through my process, so I had very similar experiences to yours as far as, you know, being in ministry and stuff in the church and was doing that for like 30 years. But uh, I would have a knowing, a word of knowledge. I mean, I would know stuff about people. I was on the ministry team in this church and uh, I had a dream about a guy. I saw this guy and I had never seen him before in my life. And then the next day, Sunday morning, I was in the church. It was kind of a U-shaped thing and I was over on the left part of the U and I looked across and I see the guy that I dreamt about the night before and you know there's a time after the service where they said if you want prayer for something come on up and one of the ministers the ministry people will pray for you well I didn't approach him at all I just stood where I was and I just kind of kept an eye on him and I saw him kind of did this convoluted walk around you know this way and that way and then he basically came around and came right up to me and said will you pray for me now, in my process of then coming out and getting divorced and coming out years later, it was like, I didn't know what to do with all that because I'm stuck with what the church had taught me. I'm bad. I'm wrong. I've chosen this. You know, this is not God's will for you. And yet I look back at all of the times that I had been quote unquote used in ministry and I didn't know what to do with any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, now what? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. If God really hates who I am or blah, 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 why did he use me that way? And so that, that was a big one for me. Yeah, you make an excellent point. If yeah. you look back in history, you know, Native Americans call gay people two-spirited, right? Two-spirited gay people, we tend to hold both the divine masculine energy and the divine feminine energy. Energy is like an atom. There's a positive charge and a negative charge. Masculine, feminine, incoming, outgoing, transmitting, receiving. Right. Everything is energy. Source is both masculine and feminine. Not boy, girl, a positive charge and a negative charge. The divine masculine, the divine feminine. When we are born two-spirited, we are more balanced with the masculine and feminine charge. So we're more open to a flow of perception outside of our five senses, which is what you are experiencing mm -hmm. in the church. But there's the conflict. I'm bad, I'm wrong, I'm sinful, I'm less than, but here I'm having this experience and I was having the same thing and you can't really talk to anybody about it because you're, I don't know if this is your experience, but this was mine. I was just happy that I was having the experience and I was trying to figure out how to come to terms with it myself and right. offer the gift, right? But the problem becomes when we have these experiences and we don't know what to do with them. Part of my work has become, and I think you've kind of experienced that, right? <laughs> you've, uh, you are a beautiful walking testimony of what's possible through this type of work. You have really allowed yourself to open up to other possibilities. I like to call just, I, I say to people, what if just for right now, we allow this to be true, which is what you were pointing to, right? Right. What happens if you just allow this to be true in this moment and open up to a possibility beyond the things that you know? what's possible. Just give yourself permission to experience what's possible, then make a decision, right? And that's what you and I have done over right. and over and over again. And what that does, it allows what's possible to continue to reveal itself and bring you back into balance and answer the question from within, 
what to do with it. <laughs> when you stop waiting for other people who don't believe, know, or understand what you're experiencing, when we allow them to shut us off from what our experience is, then we don't even get to know. But whatever it is in us that is allowing these non-physical experiences, these mystical experiences, these woo-woo experiences, right? Whatever we want to call it, these divine experiences, whatever's allowing that to manifest through us has the answers for how and what it is and how it works. And it's willing to reveal that to us. If we stop paying attention to everybody else's beliefs that we're imprinted and indoctrinated with, indoctrinated with that put us in a little box and cause us to fear that. Because this source is pure, unconditional love of God, whatever you want to call it, God, source, the universe, Jesus, whatever you want to call it, it is absent. It, it, it knows how to help us move into the absence of fear. It is not afraid of non-physicals things. It is physical. It created the possibility of expressing itself in physical form in the experience of being a human. So it has the ability to show us as humans to expand beyond what we believe the human experience is limited to. And that's the whole, uh, that's the exciting part about doing this work. That's why I'm so, I'm so honored. I mean, where you've been in the last five years and what I've witnessed, it just, it just lights me up. It's, I know it's the purpose that I'm on this planet to help people to point people back inward, to reconnect with who they are on a soul level and connect with that soul power. And right. so many people are desperate for something other than what was normal before COVID. And this is an, a remarkable opportunity and time period in the human experience. There's a lot of people waking up to this reality right now. I think we'll come back to that, but I have uh, another question popped in mind. So about, I think six months ago, I was on your table and at one point you said to me, there's a woman sitting in the corner over here. <laughs> now, obviously it wasn't a physical woman. Then you proceeded to actually describe my mother who has been dead over 20 years down to the dresses, the type of dresses that she used to wear. Talk a little bit about what you see that way. Now you've, and also you've talked about your guides. I know that I have guides. I'm gradually discovering that and listening. So talk, can you talk a little bit about that? What's that all about? Well, those seem like two different questions. Which one would you like me to address first? Whatever you want, go for one and then the other. So, um, when an energy shows up in my workspace for somebody on their table like your mother did for you, it's because they've got a message. I, that, that happens peri periodically and um, somewhat regularly, but it's not, I'm not a medium that you can book an appointment with and you're going to be guaranteed that I'm going to connect with the dead. Right. That's like not me. Like the psychic or something. Yeah. Like that, right? um, okay. That's not my calling. But because I'm an open channel and a receptive transmitter, sometimes that signal will connect with energies on the other side for somebody on my table where there's a love connection. To answer your question, so what happens is I will sense the energy. And like you said, you, you have a knowing, right? Right. I can't put it into any better words than this, but I'll say it in a way that our brains can interpret it the best they can. I will sense a presence in the room, and then I will know what the energy is. I'll know, like I'll know that it's the energy of your mother, and then I will have a flash of an image <laughs> in my mind that will put pieces together that I can share with you so whatever that energy is can make itself known to you in a way that makes sense to your mind. Hence, I'll see the dress, I'll right. see the hair color, and then I'll just be able to say, this is the, this is the essence of the energy, so it can be known to you. Okay, so talk about guides. When Not did you realize you had guides? I mean, everybody says, oh, my guardian angel saved me from the truck hitting my car, whatever. But we don't really think about any of that. We just make those statements and that doesn't really mean anything. But your guides have messages and somehow you've come into a different type of relationship, I'm assuming, than you had when you were back at Christian Minister, correct? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so talk about that. So there's some fascinating occurrences that led up to that as well. I'll try and make this as concise and succinct as possible. When I was moving from San Francisco to Palm Springs on April 1st, 
2012. I sold everything except my massage healing studio stuff. I didn't even own a car in San Francisco. So I just packed, I got a little tiny rent U-Haul, packed my stuff in there and my clothes, my, my healing massage workspace stuff and my clothes. And I was driving down from San Francisco to Palm Springs. First four hours while I'm driving, I'm thinking about the last 13 years of my life and what I'm leaving and all the awesome stuff that happened to me there. And then about the halfway point, I, I was thinking about what's ahead. What's gonna, what, what's my life gonna be? And I heard a male voice outside my head say, when you get to Palm Springs, the women are going to come. And literally the voice was so loud and audible, I turned to see who was in my car, <laughs> only to see the wall of the U-Haul truck. Oh yeah, there is no back seat, <laughs> right? right? And I'm like, well, that's fascinating. And I've heard the voice of source, um, outside of my head i don't know i think maybe five times in my life that was probably the fifth some would call that being clairaudient hearing something that's non-physical it's another way of perceiving outside of our five senses but it uses our sense you know but we're picking up something from the non-physical realm in the physical realm right so from that so that was an interesting experience and i got to sam i got to palm springs and right after that I just had this very weird sense, something wants to channel through me. And those words were coming in my head. I, my body felt different. And coming from Christianity, even with all the woo-woo work I had been doing, that felt a little, I don't know. So you know. you're thinking, oh, I wonder if I'm demonized <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or like, something like, like that. Could, what could I yeah. open myself to that, right, right? right? And then I remembered my commitment. I will only trust from what's coming within, right? right. Okay, right. if this is coming within, what if I just allow this to be true for today? What's possible? Again, making it as short as possible. There was a friend of mine that I was hanging out with early in those days. He's also very um, into esoteric spiritual things he's also a body worker we had a lot in common i told him one day i said it's so interesting i have this sense that something wants to channel through me i think i'm going to start exploring that so i bought this book how to learn how to channel and i read it and i did the processes in it and i'm like oh, this makes sense okay i'm opening to this nothing really was happening i don't know that was about two years into being here and i had some other mystical experiences prior to what i'm sharing right now that were pieces of this but early in in um the facebook days like around 2013 when facebook started pumping advertisements onto our newsfeed, right that was kind of right. that's what they were priming us for up comes this advertisement for this psychic who is going to be in palm springs i clicked on it Turns out he was going to be in Palm Springs that day. Turns out he was going to be five minutes at, around the corner at this church. When I saw the ad before I even opened it, I knew, I just knew from my knowing, I'm going to, my mother is going to channel through this guy. My mother. Another side note, me and my mom, she died in 2011. She was very Catholic. On her deathbed, we had a conversation. Even though it was contrary to her religious beliefs as she was making her exit, we made an agreement that she would go find Jesus after she died. And if he said it was okay and she could make contact with somebody on the other side, I told her I'm open and available. Her response to me was, Mark, you know I don't believe in that. I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I said, I know you don't believe in that now, Mom, but I'm just wanting you to think about it. She said, fine, I will. That was three years before she was going to die. On her deathbed, she was passing to and fro across the veil like 24 hours before she was going to die. She sat up and I said, mom, do you remember? And she cut me off and she said, when you ask me if I die, if I could ask Jesus, if I could talk to you from the other side, yes, I do. Yes, I will. Let's not talk about it anymore. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. So we made this agreement. Wow. Next day she died. Two years later, I'm in my home, get this Facebook ad, and I knew this is the guy she's gonna make contact through. Open it up, it's happening that night, it's five minutes away. I shoot the ad to a friend of mine who was at work. I said, I'm gonna to go to this tonight, you wanna to go? He said, yeah. We met there, I said, wait, before we go in, I pulled an envelope out of my pocket. I said, I've typed 15 words that are indicative of my mom. I've sealed them in this envelope, I'm gonna hand it to you. If either one of us gets a reading, let's make an agreement. Let's pull out our phones and let's tape it so we have, uh, have a recording of it. We get to this thing 
And the guy, he was amazing. He was super young. He wasn't even 30 yet. It wasn't Tyler Harry. And he would get on the stage and he explained how he worked. And he was like, there was not a lot of dog and pony show. My judgmental mind said, dude, you could present this a whole lot better. And then I'd like, <laughs> let, let that go, Mark. <laughs> right. Right. So he gets, he explains how he works. He sits on the stage. He closes his eyes. And he just points and he says, the energy's here. And he pointed right in front of the stage and he said, I got a baby. And he started talking and there was this young Latin couple that were weeping as he just kept saying, this is going on, this is going on, this is going on. And you could just feel the energy in the room. Then he goes, the energy is moving. He points to the other side in the front row and he starts talking to this guy. Then he points, he says, the energy is moved. I was way in the back on the inner aisle and he points directly at me. His eyes are closed. He's never looking at whoever he's talking to he he's not responding to people's body's language he's just delivering energy he points to me and says i got a mother-son connection from the other side i'm like that's me and i stand up and he just starts going and going and going and going it was clearly my mom i mean he's pulling out names of my twin sister and it's just like so much amazing stuff and ironically the guy who was moving through the audience, handing the person the mic that was getting the reading, was my friend who I told, I feel like something wants to channel through me. It was crazy. I didn't even know he was going to be there. I didn't know he had anything to do with the church. We touched base after that. This is just a little side note. He goes, oh my gosh, Mark, it was amazing. I'm the one who invited that guy here to the church. I hung out with him in the green room. I was his ride. He said, but you know what's so weird? All nine of you that got readings were people I knew in some capacity, like I know you, their friends, contacts. It was, he wow. invited them there and they were all like that. After that, I book a private session with this guy. I'm like, my mom's there. I had this weird sense my mom had more for me. So I call my friend, right, that night. I'm like, I need a private session with this guy. He goes, he's gone. Um, I already drove him to the airport. However, he said he would do a small group for 10. If you want to get five, Mark, I'll get five. He'll come back in two weeks. I'm like, done. So I get five. My buddy gets five. We meet in my w work studio where you come. We put a little circle of chairs right. where the massage table is. And we all have readings. But prior to that, I have a private session with him. I just knew my mom had something for me. The first person to come through is not my mom. It never even occurred to me. Let me back up. I said to the guy before I paid his, he, he was not cheap. I think it was $800 for an hour private with him. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I think he gave me uh, $500 since I hosted the thing at our house and I got five people for the 10. So I say to him, before I book this session, my mom came through at the church. I want to talk to her. I want to ask her questions. Can you do that? And he said, yes, I can, but I can't guarantee she will want to do that or have the answers. I said, fair enough. So I booked this private session and we start and same thing. He just closes his eyes. He lets the energy come through. He never opened his eyes and talked and looked at me while I was, I'm sitting, we're sitting on a couch side by side. He's never watching my body, my reacting to my body language or anything. He's just a conduit giving me information. He says, wait, your mother-in-law and your mom were friends in, in when they were alive? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, your mother-in-law said, wait, you were with your mom when she died and your mother-in-law when she died? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, wow. So your mother-in-law is expressing her extreme gratitude and how much love and how much you made her transition across the veil, just like your, you did for your mom. And I'm like, wow, didn't even occur to me anybody else would show up besides right. my mom, right? Right. Then he goes, oh, ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh, ooh, this guy's curmudgeon -y. I'm like, what? He's like, your father-in-law is here. He was pretty pissed at you for a while, wasn't he? I'm like, yes. He's like, well, he's begrudgingly, <laughs> but he's here wanting to thank you for being there for his wife when his daughter couldn't be when she was dying. I, I'm bawling right now. Like, right. And now my woo is woo AF. I'm like, okay, what's possible? What, what's possible? Right. Why did I feel this? Why did my mom and I make this agreement? Right now, I'm just keep opening to possibility. I, I so I then my mom comes through 
and we have a dialogue and she says, I'm limited in my ability to communicate with you right now, but the message that I have for you is to keep doing what you're doing, stay on the path that you are on and keep trusting what's inside of you. Hmm. And in that, it was like my mother from the other side giving me permission to let go of any hesitancy I was having about whatever wanted to channel through me. Right. I I just knew that. I, it was just like, and I could feel this wash come over me. I'm like, all right, I'm just, what's next? How do I open to this even more? And I was sitting at my desk and I just, I was in meditation and I said, I don't know what to do, but I have been fearful that something evil could overtake me. I'm releasing that. I'm trusting source. I'm trusting Jesus. I'm trusting God. I'm trusting all the guidance that has brought me to this moment. You can utilize me however you want. And I just felt this rush again, like that Kundalini awakening that back in July of 1977, I felt that hot liquid fill my head and flood my body and pool up. And it was just like, it was like the same energy already in me, just expanding. Hmm. And then I realized, oh, nothing is outside of me. This is my guides and me are one. There's just different facets of us. Of course, source is multidimensional. Okay, don't quite understand it, but I was perceiving it when I just surrendered. And then I just started to get to know more, perceive more, and began to share that information with other people. And I do that now uh, on the first Saturday of every month on an auto, uh, on a um, free conference call line where people can call in. And, um, you know, I, I have subscribers that sign up for that. Um, there's a slight fee and that's a way that people can be introduced to my work and kind of it's a, a way for me to encourage them to trust what's already inside of them so you often mention your specific guides you call them the masters of light talk a little about that so after i had that moment sitting in my at my desk and i just surrendered to allow them to whatever it was that wanted to channel through me that sense that i had i surrendered to that I don't, I had that experience that I just described, reconnecting with that pure liquid love, right? For me, whenever there is a profound energetic experience, I know that there's going to be a recalibration. Yeah, that's the best word I can use. So I knew, okay, something big just occurred. I'm just going to, to allow it. And whatever's next will begin to present itself when I'm ready for that. Probably was about another month. And I, I was already in my daily morning meditation practice. And like when an energy shows up in my space for someone like your mom showed up, right? Right. I felt a presence in my um, meditation space. And I'm like, okay, this is the first when I'm not with a client and an energy has shown up. I'm I'm available. What, what I like to say is, show me what you'll show me. That's kind of my mantra. Right. I'm, so I said, show me what you'll show me. I didn't hear the audible voice that I heard when I was driving, but there was a very distinct male energy that in my mind and in my knowing, if I could say it in English, but I wasn't hearing it in English. I was just knowing what it was communicating. It's kind of like telepathic communication. <laughs> I know that's woo-woo, but there you go. It was saying to me, I'm representing a collective. There's multiples of us here. We identify ourselves as the masters of light. And we are a subset of the elders. We're going to be in contact with you. And when I had that experience, there was this warmth within my chest cavity and my heart chakra. There was this, I can't say it any better than this, but it was like they were communicating to me, we are energy in you, but we are presenting it ourselves separate from you because your mind can perceive it better that way for now. Yeah, that was my initial experience in, in, in coming in contact with that. 
Mm. Which takes me all the way back to what I told you after my nervous breakdown. I made a declaration. I will not listen to anything outside of me. That it must resonate and it must be from what I know is true from inside of me. And here they presented externally and assured me they are inside. (laughs) In a way that made sense. Like it's my energy on a different frequency, if you will. Very interesting. (laughs) It really has been. I mean, my five-year journey with you. So, I don't know, we want to wrap it up fairly soon, but there's so many things we could talk about. What you see going on in the world energetically right now, what you're doing energetically, what what are the next things you're going to be involved in? Pick something like that and let's kind of wrap up with that. Okay, energetically what I see happening on the world is external circumstances are making it undeniably evident that we as a species can no longer live the way we've been living. Our systems don't serve the masses and the division, the anger, the hate, the war, the separation, it's going to destroy the species and the planet. But what we are not seeing, the experience that I'm having, the experience that you're having over the last five years, there are millions of us having the same experience. We are waking up, the masses are waking up in every country of the world. We're just not being told this (laughs) through the media. Millions of us are waking up and having very similar experiences that I'm having and that you're having. The more intense circumstances get on the world stage, the more people are going to wake up. And very soon we will start hearing and knowing that, oh, there's a bigger experience going on that we're all sharing that the media is not telling us about. However, thanks to social media, there are millions of people who are having similar experience to me connecting. And that's going to be the next wave, particularly during 2023, according to the Masters of Light, when things on the world stage get a little bit more tumultuous because we have to experience what's not working to come together to create what is. (laughs) So there's beauty in the breakdown. I call it, the Masters of Light call it the dismantle. There will be a dismantling of what's not working. We've all had personal dismantling of what's not working in our life since 2020, right? Nothing can be happening on the world stage that's not happening in each of us individually. Expect more supernatural experiences for the masses. That's our awakening. What's next for me... I just call it following the impulses. That same sense that I had that something wanted to channel through me, back in December I had this sense that something wanted to move through me to create painting. So I committed to every Tuesday I'm painting and I'm channeling art. I'm just letting this energy move through me and put it on canvas. And what's becoming evident to me, my desire was to see if I could paint frequency. I thought that was my idea. Like, like, oh, I'm having this idea to paint. Oh, no, I'm having the idea to paint because what's wanting to channel through me in the form of art is high vibrational frequency in physical form. So I'm just doing it. I don't know where it's going to go. But I'm when I'm in, I feel so in my happy place and so in alignment with this energy when I'm just letting it flow through me. And that's new. And then the other thing that I'm doing When I first moved to Palm Springs and that voice source told me that the women would come, they gave me this, downloaded this information, that's the best way I can say it, and I put together this program called the Goddess Mastery Experience. It's basically energy mastery for women. I started in 2017, I was gonna do it for about six years, which would take us to about now, but then we had COVID. So I'm bringing that back. I'm going to do one in August, September, and October. And then I'm going to bring that same program to men. I'm coming back to working with the men. For 20 something years, I was working with gay men. I really haven't put anything together in a group experience on this level for men, and I'm going to bring it to men. Cool. And that's going to be very soon. I look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming in again. And we're going to put your all your info, how to contact you and et cetera, like we did on the other one. Oh, the, super. In the episode notes. Any closing words that you want to throw out there? I just want to say what a joy it's been to work with you for the last five years and what uh, an honor it is to see what was 
the impulse in you to do this podcast and how quickly you put it together and all the amazing stories that you're bringing, I just want to applaud you and say, well done. Thank you, Mark. I'm very thankful you're my friend, too. Have a great day. You, too.